We must start at the foot of the cross. For our souls in danger, we're at loss. And when we kneel in that awesome place, at that very moment, you'll feel God's grace. Friend, let me tell you, you need to know, there is heaven, also hell below. Christ died on that cross to set you free from your vile sins and hell's agony. You're God's enemy without the cross. Reject Christ and to God your dross. To the prison of hell he will send, just Christ's work on the cross makes amends. God hates those who try to enter in, the gates of heaven still full of sin. Only his son can take sin away, go to the foot of the cross this day. God has provided only one way to enter heaven's wondrous array. Except what Jesus did for us all, he paid our debt so hell won't befall. Go to the foot of the cross this day, his precious blood washes sin away. We each need to think more of his cross, without our Savior we are total loss. Hello and welcome everybody to a new video from York, Juggler 66, Hour of the Truth. This is the start of a little, I think, seven part series that I dug out that comes from the very beginning that I ever did a radio show and the time with uh, Walt Stickle, who was the host of the website Grand Design Exposed, who still is, but who is not a brother in Christ with me anymore because he turned. And I'm not going into that and, uh, and explaining that, <clears throat> but I just want to show you this series that we did at the end of 2013 in the month of November, starting um, and, and finishing in, in the beginning of 2014, I think, uh, that was in, in, in 2014, beginning of January, where that was the last broadcast. and. We wanted to continue, but never got the time, and uh, in 2015, Walt and I parted ways. And um, so this series that you are going to see is called The Jesuits, Derooting the Reformation. And we did some seven broadcasts on talk show in that time, just uh, Walt and me, as far as I remember. Maybe there was here and there a guest with us. I, I just don't remember anymore. I haven't listened to this work all this time. And because it's from the end of 2013, and now we are approaching the end of 2018, it's almost five years, so I've come a long way in the meantime. But this work is only published on, uh, as far as I know, one YouTube channel, who took the seven audios, put them all in one video, and that video he put up on YouTube, and that's seven hours and 20 minutes long. So I thought there was still some interesting information that we were covering at that time and of course you know the title speaks for itself it's uh, the Jesuits derooting the Reformation um, in remembrance to when the Bible says that there were ten horns that came after the fall of Rome and from this ten horns three were plucked up by the roots yeah we can read that in the book of Daniel uh, the three divisions that were plucked up were the Heruli in 493, the Vandals in 534, and the Ostrogoths in 538. And this was about the time of the rise of the Antichrist, of the Pope in Rome, plucking out these three nations. And the Jesuits are sworn to do the same with the Reformation and to do the same with all the Protestants in the world. And that was our motivation in the time to do this broadcast, to start this broadcast, not knowing that it would lead us to seven episodes and uh, even wanting to speak more about, because I think at the end of the seven episodes we went into uh, analyzing or starting to analyze World War II. 
And of course, for that, you can turn to my book reading of Behind the Dictators, and you can turn to the book reading of Secret History of the Jesuits by Edmond Paris that I've done in the meantime. And there you will get a lot of information on World War II. But that was kind of the way we wanted to go with this. And um, yeah, we didn't we didn't go all the way because in the end, well, you will know in the last broadcast why we stopped for a time. And um, it's just that this work has never been broadcast on any on my channels. This is why I'm now broadcasting this on my second channel. Um, because I think there is still some relevant work in there, but of course there are, well, not, not there are, but of course I am not affiliated with Walt Stickle anymore. And uh, I don't want to be affiliated with him anymore, but the problem is I cannot publish these broadcasts and cut them out because we are doing this together. So I have to live with that. But on the other hand, I think that there is some, still some interesting information for the people out there in the world to get from this, what I'm showing here in these videos. And that's why I'm now making this introduction and I want you to see this. I want you to follow at least, uh, that's my wish, all seven episodes and see what kind of work I did five years ago. And of course also see how much uh, not only I have grown, but how the understanding of the Bible, the understanding of the world, and the understanding of history even has grown. And still I think that here is mentioned some things um, that you will not find that easily spoken of in videos. Anyway, I don't want to make a too long introduction now. I'm going to make my work and um, take that word paper that I was using uh, where I read different things from as well in German as in English. <clears throat> and I will publish that on archive.org, so you can download that uh, for your information and for your own research and, and go along with these seven parts of the Jesuits derouting the Reformation. And I just hope that this will edify you and um, that will give you a probably even much better understanding of the Jesuits as you have right now when you follow this and... Um, well, if you don't have a very good understanding of the Jesuits, then that this one is going to help you to get a better understanding of the situation, because the Jesuits are sworn to wipe out the Reformation, wipe out the Protestants, and get the Pope back in the ultramontane leading seat of the world, so that he can be Lord of the world, as is the last book of P.D. Stewart called, that is still not out yet of Pope Francis, Lord of the World, because that's the end goal of the quote-unquote New World Order. Restoring the Old World Order, the time before the Protestant Reformation, where the Roman Pontiff ruled supreme, and that's just their goal. And this is what these seven broadcasts are dealing with, how that in history was achieved, even though I know today much more about that history and have read more books but that's for another case. That's maybe for you then when you have listened to this to get involved in many of my other readings and work and look at that also to get an even better understanding of the history. But, okay, here comes the first video and um, I hope you'll be edified by that. And don't forget, first, always study your Bible, the 1611 King James authorized version of the Bible. Thank you very much, and now enjoy the broadcasts. Recorded live. Greetings and welcome to Mystery Babylon Radio. It's uh, November 7th, 2013, and our topic tonight is uh, the Jesuits derooting the Reformation. My guest is... Uh, Jörg Glisman of Belgium, and uh, just to give a little short uh, bio, uh, would you, uh, Jörg, where, you're, where you live, and just a short bio. Yes, thank you, Walt, for the opportunity to come on here and to tell our listeners about a little bit something about the Jesuits that they haven't probably known yet, 
Um, my name is Jörg Wissmann. I live in Belgium since 23 years, but I'm born and raised German uh, from Hamburg. Um, I um, started studying the truth, as you can call it, about uh, three years ago. So it took me a long time to wake up because I was born in 1966. I'm 47 years old by that way. And most of the time I was an ignorant sheep with closed eyes. And um, like many people are, uh, well, it's kind of a shame. And so that whole, whole process of uh, getting woken up took me almost three years to and until I found my belief, until I found Christ. It's also something very important, I think, because I was, all of my life, I was a non-believer in, in the God of the Bible because I always questioned myself that if the God was such a loving God who loved all, uh, all of us, how can it be that there is so much injustice in the world, that there is so much death and hunger and starvation and for uh, most of for all, um, starvation not only physically but also psychology, uh, psychology uh, starvation. People dump down the way that you go to school, the way that you are indoctrinated things instead of really learning something. So, <clears throat> after almost three years studying the New World Order, I came to the fact that there was much more. Uh, on it than just uh, just the New World Order from the Builder Burgers and the Zionists, what they always say. There was some more about it, and I found out about um, the Jesuits. Um, yeah, and by that, um, I guess we are here today and uh, going to enlighten a little bit on that on that subject a little bit more. Okay. Okay, you know, first of all, let's, let's let's set a little platform. I mean, let's talk about the Reformation. This, this, what is the Reformation? You know, there, there's going to be people come through here in the secular world that don't read the Bible. Mm-hmm. You know, it's this is very important. If somebody uh, doesn't believe in the Bible, you should fully understand that the, the little freedom that you do have comes from the cross, and it was because yeah. of the Reformation. The Reformation exploded uh, in uh, in Europe, and it was Martin Luther who n- nailed the 95 Theses on the Wittenberg Church. It all started in 1517, uh, the 31st of uh, October. So that's just an anniversary that's just a week behind us now, because we are today the 7th. Mm-hmm. And that was the 31st of October in uh, 1517, when he nailed the 95 Theses. Uh, at the church door in Wittenberg, which is mm-hmm. a small town in what today you call Eastern Germany. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Uh, yeah. I have the 95 Theses here in front of me because I looked them up on the internet. Yeah. And um, those are theses where he actually tells the people, because you have to understand at that time nobody read the Bible because um, the Bible was only if available in Latin, and people didn't talk Latin. Uh, they spoke German in Germany, they spoke English in England, um, they spoke Dutch in the Netherlands and French in France, and you know, so the Bible wasn't accessible to to, to the normal population. Um, and um, what he did was uh, proclaiming 95 points where actually the Catholic doctrine that was taught from uh, from the council every Sunday when they went to that sun worship Sabbath, people had even no idea that they were wrong. Everything that was preached, uh, these 95 points, nailed it up to uh, what actually was wrong teaching. And that uh, set up um, the Reformation. He, he did that in uh, 1517, and uh, he got... Uh, Persecuted for it, and he had to come before a council in uh, in the city of Mainz, which is nearby the city of Cologne, that probably everybody knows in Germany, uh, with the big dome, uh, this big city. Mainz is a little bit south of that, and then he had to go to the emperor, 
and explain himself and uh, he even had to repent mm-hmm. of the things that he did because he actually was a Catholic priest at that time but uh, his, uh, his conscience came to him uh, he saw that he was teaching false doctrines because he could read the Bible and he saw that that the things that are taught were not the same things um, as they stood in the Bible. He, he went to Rome, uh, he went to the Vatican, he went up that stair, he went also there to repent and had to pay for give his sins, uh, uh, sins forgiven. And then it doomed him that uh, not everything is really right the way it should be, actually. And that is one of the reasons why he nailed those 95 pieces on there and then he went to Mainz and he he did not repent, but he said, um, "If you can prove me, uh, if you can prove me in Scripture that I am wrong, then I will repent." But of course, in Scripture, you cannot prove him wrong because he was um, just relying on the Scripture with the yes. things that he said. <laughs> and on, yeah, sorry, sorry, I, I just want to continue for a moment. Uh, and on the way back from Mainz, uh, he was he was uh, so-called kidnapped, but that was a staged kidnapping. And he was brought to a castle uh, where he lived in confinement, in, in confinement for uh, I think about almost two years, and where he had, um, where he lived under a pseudonym, uh, means a false name. That was uh, that false name was Junker Jörg. So I find that quite of interesting because Jörg is also my first name, my Christian name. Um, and he went there for two years, and that's where he got the possibility to translate the Bible into the German. And after doing that, they had the possibility to give the people for the first time in history the word of the Lord in their own language, that they could read it. And that started the Reformation all over Europe. Yes. And yet, at this time, you know, uh, we have a listener tonight, today, and um, and, uh, this... I've learned this is it's been a year since I've met Lori. She has a, a radio broadcast, Lori's Talk News Radio, that's broadcast seven days a week up on Blog Talk. And uh, I've heard uh, this question that I'm going to ask her. She's I've heard her say, say it on her broadcast. And uh, Lori, what I want to ask you, Lori, is what what was life like before the Re- the Reformation? Welcome to the broadcast, Lori. Well, thank you all for having me on. Um, from the research that I've done, it's, it's referred to as the, the Dark Ages. And as I've said, it's not because we didn't have electrical power. It's because a light had come into the world and darkness comprehended it not. And darkness tried to keep that word, that light, uh, just like Yurk had said, uh, from the common people. And uh, and they had no idea what it said because there were only certain people who were able to read that, again, as Jörg had said in, in this, this, this Latin. And so it truly was a, a form of darkness, the most insidious kind. It, it, how did it affect the people on the streets? Well... <clears throat> Since they didn't know, and they just were told that these priests uh, were basically may as well have just floated from God down from God directly, then actually tell them that. Uh, if, if one of them pointed their little bony finger at you and said, "You will be excommunicated," people's knees knocked together. They were told that was the only way to heaven, the only way to God, and they had no way to know any different because they could not read the Bible for themselves. Mm-hmm. Y- y- yes, uh, this is what I w- w- what we're trying to we're laying a foundation here. The title of this broadcast is the Jesuits derooting the Reformation. In other words, the Jesuits were formed uh, about thirty years later in 1545. I, I not know the exact date, but the Jesuits were formed to counter the Reformation. So the reason why we have the word Jesuits derooting the Reformation is there. That's another derooting is another way of turning this around 
and taking this out and sweeping this out of the minds of the people. And um, and, and, and so, and one other point before we start, uh, and I'm, I'm going to be asking uh, Yerk, he's going to start, we're going to start with this, a little bit of history that will bring us up to, uh, to the present time, is, uh, is uh, excuse me, I lost my turn of thought here a little bit, excuse me. But uh, uh, um, the <clears throat> excuse me. Well, listen. Oh, oh, I excuse me. The reason what I wanted to say here is this: what really fueled the Reformation is when all the reformers. There was more reformers than just Martin Luther, but Martin Luther was the one that paved the way. He's the he was. And you had Calvin, and you had John Knox, and uh, but what fueled it is when they all pinned the tail on the donkey, that the Antichrist was the papacy. That's when the Reformation exploded. And after this explosion, I mean, Rome was losing its power, its power base, because at the before the Reformation. The kings were, were they ruled by divine right. They had to get the right from from the pope, and 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 the civil law was hooked in with 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 Rome. In other words, it was all the church and state, and they, and and the Inquisition that was prior to that was done legally because the church and state were one. And so, with that, I want to. Uh, uh, let uh, York give us a little bit of history, starting with and start off with. We will we'll start off with the Thirty Year War, and so uh, go ahead, York. Yeah. Um, before I start about the Thirty Year Old War, I just wanted to say the founding of the of the Jesuits, the Society of Jesus, that it's called actually, uh, wasn't in 1540. In 1540, Pope Gregory acknowledged them and. Uh, wrote a papal bull that officially uh, led them into the Roman Catholic Church, but they were founded about 1534 already, before that. Uh So they had a very nice time before that also to structure themselves before they did that. And um, then um, the Counter-Reformation really started with the Council of Trent uh, that was on between 1545 and 1563. And there were a lot of... uh, dogmatic differences to the Protestants, uh, to the Protestantism uh, wrote, written out. And um, that Council of Trent was really led by the Jesuits from beginning to the end. And it's really their uh, handwriting, you can say. And, uh, so you can, you can study the Council of Trent, what was said there, and then you have an idea of the, uh, of the Catholic doctrine on that time. Um, and that was... Uh, that was in ruling until the 60s of the last century, where we have this. Um, help me a little bit, Walt. What was that uh, that council called there? Uh, it, it was uh, Vatican II, I think. Uh-huh. The name Vatican. was. The Vatican II, I think, was in the 60s. Were you talking? Yeah, that was in the 60s of last century. Yeah, yeah. and uh, that that even didn't change the things of the council on on, on trends. It just uh, underlined some some things and made some things even clearer, but. Uh, the general line is still the same. Yes. So that means that for about 400, almost 500 years, that we are living in the times of uh, the Counter-Reformation. But, of course, when you speak of the Counter-Reformation, you first have to understand what the Reformation was. And we uh, already did that in a few words, that you explain to the people what the Reformation was. And that was bringing the world, uh, bringing the, the word of God to the people and uh, by that weakening, of course, um, the Pope in Rome, who rules in Germany. I, I say Germany here between brackets because in that time you didn't have Germany. Um, you have to know when you when you go back um, that long time, we have had a so-called Holy Roman Empire, yeah, um, that was a multi-ethnic and complex union of territories in Central Europe. And that existed from 692 to 1806. And this Holy Roman Empire 
had a part that was called um, Germany, that German in there was, was actually called the Holy Roman Empire of German nationality. That was part of it. But Germany in that way didn't exist. Germany had different uh, kingdoms, like you had uh, Bavaria, Prussia, Saxons, you know. They were all divided. There was not one Germany as we know it today or as we know it in the, in the, in the recent history. Um, how much uh, so that uh, and that was ruled by an emperor who was elected by powerful princes or kings and how much power the emperor had was the princes bishops and the pope was highly controversial issue uh, even the um, uh, the emperor wasn't always in germany he sometimes sat in france or he sat in italy he sat in, uh, in rome uh, wasn't even there and century by century, the emperor lost power until Napoleon abolished the empire as a Julius Anacronism, and that was in 1806. Uh, so <clears throat> the, the title of this empire was revived in 962 when Otto I was crowned Holy Roman Emperor, uh, and uh, beginning an unbroken line of emperors running for over eight centuries. Although Charlemagne, that is one of the guys you probably know from history lessons, was uh, the first to bear the title and the agglomeration grew out of his empire. Otto I is generally regarded as the founder, and the date of his coronation is the beginning of the Holy Roman Empire. And in a decree following the 1512 uh, Diet of Cologne, the name was officially changed to Holy Roman Empire of the German nation. So in addition to conflicts between his Spanish and, and German inheritances, conflicts of uh, religion would be another source of tension during the reign of Charles V before Charles even began his reign in the Holy Roman Empire in 1517, Martin Luther initiated what would later be known as the Reformation. At this time, many local dukes saw it as a chance to oppose the hegemony of Emperor Charles V. The empire then became fatally divided along religious lines with the north, east, and many of the major cities like Strasbourg, Frankfurt, and Nuremberg becoming Protestant, while the southern and western regions largely remained Catholic. So here you have a very uh, interesting division, and you have to know that at that time, um, the kings or the princes that had ruling over their region were free to allow any religion that they wanted to allow. So if they wanted to be Protestant, they could have they could be Protestant. That was actually possible. So then afterwards we had the Nepo, uh, Napoleonic Confederation of the Rhine that was replaced by a new union, the German Confederation in 1815, uh, following the end of the Napoleonic Wars. Um, it lasted until 1866 when Prussia founded the North German Confederation, a forerunner of the German Empire, which united the German-speaking territories outside of Austria and Switzerland under Prussian leadership in 1871. And this later served as the predecessor state of modern Germany. So there, in 1871, um, I will come back to that later, in 1871 we can actually speak of the Second Empire, because, or the Second Reich because everybody knows about when you talk about Germany, you think automatically of the Third Reich. So but if there was a Third Reich, what was the first and what was the second? So the First Reich was actually the Holy Roman Empire of German nation for a thousand years. And then you had the Second Reich that lasted just between 1871 and um, the end of World War I in 1918. Okay? Um, so what I was uh, going to tell here is that um, in 1571, uh, the Lutherans were thrown out of Bavaria. Now, Bavaria is the most south uh, country that you have today in Germany, has borders with Austria, Switzerland, uh, uh, the Czech Republic, um, Everybody knows Bavaria by the football team, by Munich, I guess. So that's known to the people. And in 1571, all the Lutherans were just thrown out of the country, and a spiritual advisory board was founded, and an index of forbidden books was made. 
and since 1556, the Jesuits, the Jesuits had the University of Ingolstadt and the University of Dillingen made their center of the Catholic reform in Germany, starting 1556. So that's only about 16 years after the inauguration by Pope Gregory III. Okay. And then when we go a little bit further, we come to uh, 1648, and that is the end of the 30-year war that's uh, run from 1618 to 1648. And uh, at the end of that was signed a treaty, a peace treaty that uh, is in the books as the Westphalian Peace Treaty. And the nationalism was the upcoming idea. So, but what happened in this 30-year war? In this 30-year war, about 12 million people perished, and most of it were um, the Protestant Germans, because it was really a fight of the Catholics to gain uh, the lost areas in eastern Germany and in northern Germany back. Uh, also, Sweden was involved, Denmark was involved, um, that was actually kind of a world war if you consider the known world by that time, more or less. So many many states were involved in that. Can I um, can I ask you? Something? Now, yeah. Are we are you talk are you talking right now on the Thirty Year War? Yes. Okay. Go ahead. Excuse me. Okay. But yeah. this, but this is the Thirty Year War between sixteen eighteen and sixteen forty eight. Okay. And uh, where about twelve million people perished, and that involved a lot of countries like. Like Sweden was involved, Spain was involved, Netherlands were involved. Um, there were a lot of countries involved in, the, in, in that war. Yes. And it was mostly for the Catholics to regain uh, um, the power in the northern part and in the eastern part of Germany. And also what is a very interesting point here is that you, uh, that you consider Poland. Because Poland is actually the biggest success of the Counter Reformations, um, uh, uh, of the Counter Reformation actions that were taken, um, uh, because the nobility in the 16th century in Poland was Protestant. Polish kings were Catholic, and King Sigismund III, who lived between 1586 and 1632, so also during the time of the Thirty Year War, he was Jesuit trained. And uh, in 1717, um, was uh, it got forbidden to, bu- to build new evangelical churches, and every evangelical or Protestant church that was built uh, since 1632 was ordered to be torn down. And if you um, denied the Catholic faith, the death penalty was written unto you in Poland. And so in, in, in this matter, the Jesuits succeeded in just 50 years to get the country that was one of the biggest uh, Protestant countries, actually, 50 years before, and the Jesuits within 50 years made it uh, Catholic. And ever since then, Poland is a Catholic country. That also maybe explains why John Paul II was a uh, pope that came from Poland. You, you, yeah. you know, I, I just want to say, the people that are listening that don't know this history and see how important the Reformation and what it caused, remember what he said, this 30-year war, there was 12 million killed. I've heard read an article that less than you know, one-third of Germany I mean, it almost just completely destroyed Germany. I mean, this is devastating. 12 million. Yeah, yeah most of all the northern and the eastern part of Germany. Yeah, yeah and well, I don't... That, that the Protestants were really, really I, powerful I, I, at that time. I hope I'm not getting ahead of you, but you mentioned Bavaria. Mm-hmm. Uh, in, 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 in a, you see, you have to understand that this Catholic Protestant, how it was... What it was the battle. You see, Bavaria, what has they threw the Protestants out, and even to the in, even to this day, it is solidly Catholic. It's like yeah. it's like a Spain. Spain, the, the the Protestant Reformation never got into Spain. 
and it never got into Bavaria. So uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to just m- mention this so it sticks in our mind. The Bavarian Illuminati was formed in 1776. Some very interesting people come out of Bavaria. So just also just keep that in mind. I just wanted to uh, bring that out. Yeah, that's also why I mentioned uh, the University of Ingolstadt that was founded about 1556. So that's a very old uh, university. And at that university, uh, Adam Weishaupt got the order uh, by 1773 to found uh, a secret society called uh, the Illuminati. And they were put into power 1st of May, 1776. First of May, always a very interesting date. Today we have that Labor Day almost all over the world. Eh? It's, yeah. um, it's, it's it's so much a question why that is a, why that is a, a day of celebration. <laughs> well, well, it's my, the date that the Illuminati were inaugurated. Yeah, yes, and that that's that year 1776. That's on the back of our dollar bill. You see, that is yeah. a very important date, and we have a, a very very important. Season, we have yeah. a we have a broadcast on Sundays that we're covering the, the, the 1776. But you know, and also I, 13 years later, eh, because it's uh, 1789, then what's the French Revolution? Yeah, 13, 13 years later. 13 years later, yes, and it it was and it was the Jes the Jesuit influence and the fact that that Adam Weishaupt uh, was teaching Roman canon law. You see, in other words, people in, your, in, in the world today, see, this is why, let's go back to the title, the Jesuits derooting Protestantism. What they're doing is they're taking this part of the puzzle out of the equation where people cannot see it. And that's why I learned this on Lori's Talk News Radio. We kind of make a joke of it. In 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. Columbus was a Catholic, sailed, and in 1776 we had America, and nobody understands, nobody has any history prior to 1776, and this is what York is bringing out. I mean, this is where the Reformation, and I want to bring this in right now too. There's two parts of the Reformation. There's a spiritual side and a power struggle. The power struggle was more in England. England is the only country that has ever been, ever become a Protestant government. In the 17th century. Yeah, yes, and, and, and it was a short-lived. It wasn't, it hasn't, I mean, it's been overtaken now. But, but, but the point is, it, the spiritual side of the Reformation, the heart of it is in Germany. That's where it exploded. I yeah, mean, that's also why so many Germans uh, immigrated from Germany to the United States of America. Yes, we have a large population. Yeah, actually, um, actually, this week I got to know that it's about uh, 49 million <clears throat> with uh, German roots in the United States of America compared to 26 million with uh, roots of English heritage. So the Germans had uh, the, the, uh, the, product, majority, the majority of it. And, and, yes. that was, and the Germans that came there, that were all the Germans that were Protestant because they were, um, they were prosecuted in their own country. And you had from France the Huguenots, and you had from, uh, from the Netherlands, uh, you had the Buren, who also went to South Africa. But that's another story. Uh, but you had all these, um, all these Protestant groups that were prosecuted uh, in their home nation, in their home country, and they, tra- uh, they saw the chance of coming to a new world where there was freedom of religion, and um, they thought that there the Protestantism, Protestantism could be lived out. But of course, if you listen closely uh, and you understand that freedom of religion uh, is not what uh, a nation under God would, uh, would do, because God doesn't allow freedom of religion, because that's only his religion, actually. Freedom of religion is a Jesuit doctrine. 
And that's why also the Jesuits were very much involved in the founding of the United States of America. Yes, and also that's another reason uh, that I have gleaned so much from conversations when we talk is because, you see, uh, uh, I'm 50% German, but my grandmother and grandfather were 100% German, and they spoke at the family picnics. They spoke German. We had big family picnics. We'd meet up in the mountains, and we'd fill up a whole park. And, and I grew up listening to German at, at the picnics, not knowing really what, what, what it's all about. And so what uh, Yerk is bringing to the table here is the German influence from Germany in this country. You know, I mean, the, the, the Protestants, so as, as time goes on and we start talking about this derooting, we're not going to go there right now. We're not going to go there, but in the future, as time goes, we're going to start talking about World War II. But keep always in mind that, that, that how, how important the, the Germans are in history, and they, they're not to be left out. They're not to be left out of the equation. And uh, that's a very interesting figure that 49 million, you know, with, with German influence and 26 English. I mean, this is all, and, and of course, they, they, now with the, with, the, with the border in the south, I mean, and as time has went on, you know, the Roman the Catholic Church has used immigration to change the demographics of this country. So anyway, that's that's what I wanted to say, uh, Eric. Mm-hmm. Now, I, I wanted to go a little bit on about the Second German Reich because um, that's yes. something I remember also because I, I, I told you I come from Hamburg. And a little bit outside of Hamburg is Friedrichsruh. Um, that's in the east of Hamburg. And Friedrichsruh is the place where Bismarck lived. And um, if you don't know Bismarck, Otto von Bismarck was the so-called Iron Chancellor. And he actually was the founder of the Second German Reich after the Franco-German War between 1870 and 1871. It was one year. And in that one year, the German troops finally triumphed over France and arrested Napoleon III. And then they went, um, even before the truce was proclaimed, they went into the Hall of Mirrors at Versailles and let the French sign the peace treaty and as a result of that treaty the German, uh, the German Reich or the German Empire uh, was founded so um, there are a lot of famous rooms in the palace of Versailles but the hall of mirrors is the most important one and there are many famous uh, political meetings they were held on, 18th, uh, on January the 18th of 1871. And at that point, with that treaty signed there, all German small states like Bavaria, like Saxon, like Prussia, this really known uh, state, but all splinter states, were now united in one German nation state. And that way, the Second German Empire was born. But actually... That is because the Germans humiliated the French by signing that contract in the Hall of Mirrors at Versailles. Now, why do you think the Germans were humiliated in 1918 in the same place by the Allies of the World War I? It's all connected together. History repeats itself. The Germans used that place to humiliate the French, and the Allies, at the end of World War I, used the place to humiliate the Germans. Blame them on the outbreak of World War I, and putting on them reparations that Germany had to pay until, I think, if I'm not mistaken, 2003, the last payment was done. Up until then, Germany has paid the reparations for this World War I. I'm not talking about World War II. That's, that's another stuff. But that's kind of interesting. So then in 1871, Bismarck 
founded the Second German Reich, and in 1872, he pushed a law that threw the Jesuits out of Germany. From that point on, Jesuitism was forbidden in Germany. Schools had been closed, uh, universities had to be closed, uh, the closeness, uh, the abbeys had to be closed, all that stuff. They were thrown out. And do you know when that law was um, abolished? 1917. During World War I, when the Americans entered the war. Let's, can I just recap, just understand yes. what, what York just said. They threw the Jesuits out of the country. For people that don't understand who the Jesuits are, this is what this is all about, is to counter the Reformation. Briefly, just briefly, just look at America. We have 28 Jesuit universities, 50 Jesuit high schools, 216 Catholic universities in the parochial system. Now, the Jesuits have not only been thrown out of Germany, they've been thrown out of 80-some countries for meddling in government. Now, the only thing I'm going to say is this. When we look at America, see, they have never been thrown out of America because this is their refuge. This is their stronghold. What we are discussing here today, if, if, the, if, if another, if the, the people in, a, in this world understand who was causing, and, caught, and let's say uh, by the grace of God that a reformation was sparked, that people understood who their oppressors were. This is the reason why the, this is the main goal of this broadcast in this series. The Jesuits de-rooting the Reformation. So, anyway, yeah. don't lose your spot will, there, York. Yeah, we will, we will uh, I think in another, in another broadcast, we will uh, go into the Jesuit oath because that will be very interesting for people to know. Uh, but a part of this Jesuit oath is that, uh, you can read of it, that the Jesuits will never forgive and they will never forget. And they will always take vengeance and they will totally annihilate the people who were against them. Yeah, and I... Germany was against them by starting 1517 when... Luther nailed the 95 Thesis at the church uh, door when he then dared to translate the Bible and give the common man the possibility to read the Word of God, to read the truth, and to really study that Jesus is our Savior and that you don't have to pay the Catholic Church money to get off your sins and that there is no purgatory, but that you only have to turn to Jesus Christ and repent for your sins, and that you will be forgiven by him, and by that will be saved by grace alone. And that is, of course, a big bummer for the Catholic Church, who got a lot of money from all the people who went every week to the church and paid for, Father, I have sinned this, Father, I have sinned that. Then they could just pay money, say, ten uh, Hail Marys, or whatever, and they were so-called forgiven. And now, at that time, when Luther started uh, this uh, Bible in Germany, uh, afterwards you had others that then uh, put the Bible in English, like you had then in 1611, the King James Bible, um, which is up to today the most uh, successful Protestant English-spoken Bible, to my knowledge, um, and the most correct also, you have, very, you have, very, uh, you have to be very aware of uh, other uh, biblical publications because um, a lot of them are forged, altered, uh, things left out, things, le uh, things put in, 
and uh, God already said in the uh, original Bible that that is not allowed to change any of the word that he has said because his word is the truth. So you have to understand how important that uh, that uh, reformation was because that reformation, that what Luther did, took away the power the Vatican had over all the people of Europe. It just took away the power. People just woke up. It's like from from today from tomorrow you have the internet and you will have all the information that, that you want to have if you want information. That was just the way they had it. They had a book they could read, they could understand. It was in their own language and it told them what really uh, believe is all about. And that's why the, the Reformation is so much important. And then, of course, yeah, uh, a few years later, the, the Luther Bible came out in 1522. 1534, you had the foundation of the Jesuits. 1540, you had the papal bull that uh, in, installed them uh, officially. 18 years after that, they started, and then uh, with the Council of Trent that we were talking about already, uh, they started really the Counter-Reformation to take back the power that was taken from them by oppression. And we are not talking about, yeah, we are talking about the dark ages, but like Laurie said, not because they didn't have electric power, and that's not the point, but the dark ages also because of the prosecution. I mean, we're talking about the Inquisition here. And that is the first Inquisition that we had in those years that was already when... Uh, they were witch hunting and, and sorcery hunting and all that and calling everybody who did not believe in the Catholic doctrine a heretic uh, because you could believe in Jesus Christ and yeah, you are a heretic because you don't follow the uh, Catholic doctrine. And then you had the Inquisition and people were killed by the millions in Spain and in France and also in Germany, all over Europe by the Inquisition. If you did not accept the Catholic doctrine as the one and only, and if you did not accept the Pope as the God on earth, as the vicar of Christ, you were tortured to death. Or until you repented, so-called. I, I like to, I'd like to insert here something. Uh, again, people that... Uh, uh, of course, this broadcast is from the biblical standpoint. If somebody casually look, listening to what we're talking about, I want to say it again to drive this point home. The little bit of freedom that we do have comes from the cross. And people, and if every, the, the educational system of the world is Jesuitical, is teaching studio, ratio studiorum, learning upon learning, loading them, loading them. And when people go to universities, they don't go there to give their opinions. They're, the, they're, they're a sponge. And this is what we see. This is what we see on a world basis. And this is why, the, why, and I'm talking to the secular, inviting people that never read the Bible, I'm just going to throw something out here. Lori Berkebile was raised 17 years a, 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 a Catholic. And she was an atheist at one time. It's embarrassing. But to be honest, and why? What happened to Lori Berkebile? I'll tell you why. Somebody gave her a Bible. And she read it. And uh, Lori has said this to me before. You get the truth inside your head, and it starts rolling around your head. You can't get rid of it. So my appeal is to the secular world to fully understand what's going on with all this agenda, Agenda 21, the vaccines, the GMO on our foods. You know, you need to get into the archives of Lori's Talk News Radio. Lori's been on the, on the air for the last year, three hours a day. And this, this is one of the reasons why I went to the mic. 
and this broadcast, I'm not trying to elevate Lori Berkebile, but Lori Berkebile went to the mic. And if it wasn't for Lori Berkebile, I would have never met Yerk. You see, and I would have never had the courage to go to the mic and bring this out. And so the secular world, my appeal to you is get get a copy of the King James Bible, the oldest history book available, because all the pieces to the puzzle are in that book. Yeah, or, or in German, the Luther Bible from 1545. Yeah. Yes, yes. Depends on depends on depends on what language of course you speak, you know. Mm-hmm. There are more than 120 million people in Europe that speak German and they can use the Luther Bible. I, I want to thank you that you start uh, that you start um, your your little talk about um we have to go to the cross. Yeah? We have to remember the cross. I today uh watched a video on on YouTube uh, from Alan Lamont, where he put in uh, a poem of the cross. And I'd like to read that. It only will take a few minutes. But um, you have to listen carefully, and then you... I, I think this will a little bit of uh, emphasizing what Walt just said. So, here it comes. We must start at the foot of the cross. For our souls in danger, we are at loss. And when we kneel in that awesome place... At that very moment, you feel God's grace. Friend, let me tell you, you need to know, there is heaven, also hell below. Christ died on that cross to set you free from your vile sins and hell's agony. You're God's enemy without the cross. Reject Christ and to God you are dross. So the prison of hell he will send, just Christ's work on the cross makes amends. God hates those who try to enter in, the gates of heaven still full of sin. Only his son can take sin away, go to the foot of the cross this day. God has provided one own, only one way to enter heaven's wondrous array. Accept what Jesus did for us all, he paid our debts. So hell won't be fall. Go to the foot of the cross this day. His precious blood washes sin away. We each need to think more of his cross. Without our Savior, we are total lost. End quote. Praise God. And the point why I read this, and, and, and the point also Walt said already, uh, go to the cross and the people have to know about the Reformation and it, it's something that I told uh, Walt about uh, about in any, co- any time that we were on the phone the last weeks. every time I said to him you know Walt, the generations the two or three generations that are now currently in the world are the generations that are the most far from God as any generation ever has been in this world. Never have the people been more taken away from the word of God. Never have they been more distracted by television, by propaganda media, by brainwashing in schools, jobs that they do, study in universities, whatever, haven't been taking the attention away by movies from Hollywood, by TV series, by sports, like the last three generations. They do everything, everything to let you forget the Bible, to let you forget that there is a God. And as long as you don't get that, you are lost. There is more to life than just going to school, getting a job, going in the hamster wheel, in and in every day, to pay at the end of the year your taxes, have a kid or two, go on vacation once in a while, buy a new car every five or six years, and at the end, after 70 years, 
just give the spoon away and say, thanks, that was it. There is more to life than that. But they are, and for they, I mean most of all the Jesuits, they are doing a wonderful job, a wonderful job, to really distract you of the things that are important in this life. And uh, sorry, Walt, can I have another few minutes because there's something that I really would like to add here right away, or do you want to intervene for a moment? Okay, I think that I can go on, otherwise you would have said something. There's something... Uh, excuse, felt... excuse, excuse me, I, yeah. I, I, Mike, was, Lori has a comment. Um, uh, yeah, Lori? Okay. Well, I wanted to make a comment quite some time ago, so this is going to be rather non-sequitur, but I, or appear to be. It was not when I had it. But I think it's very important for people to understand when Yurk was speaking about the history in the country, you mentioned about England, so on and so forth. I want to go back to pre-1776 in this country. Most people, uh, specifically Americans, are not aware of the fact that in the original 13 colonies, you can look up and find online their own constitution. The original uh, 13 colonies, uh, you had to be Protestant to have to hold any political office. It didn't specify you had to be Baptist or Lutheran or anything like that, but you had to be Protestant. And a lot of people, again, I don't think are aware that we had 10 presidents under the Articles of Confederation before George Washington. So there was indeed a brief period of about 11, 13 years thereabouts where we still had the Protestant uh, a heritage from England, but then in, in 1789 ratified the Constitution, so on and so forth. And I, I wanted to point that out because I don't think most Americans, well, I know most Americans are not aware of those facts. Yeah, Laurie, you're absolutely right with that because, you know, in the beginning of, the, of America, you had 99.9% Protestants and only 0.1 or 1% the most Catholics, and these one per, this one percent Catholics uh, really succeeded in taking over that country. Right, and, and as Walt has pointed today. out, by 1850 they were the majority, and that's yeah. that's that's a little that's not it's just a factoid just people need to rattle around in their head. That's significant that from 1776 to 1850 went from one one hundredth of a percent to being the majority. That's you. Yes. And that is, that is uh, and therefore we're doing this a little bit, that is how the Jesuits work. Because the, the Jesuits um, infiltrate anything, also the Protestants. And by that they are taking things over. Like today they have taken over every church, uh, whether it's Buddhism, uh, whether it's, uh, of course, Catholicism, but also the evangelical churches have been totally taken over uh, via the Jesuits, and they are now building on this universal church with the end goal, uh, with the end, uh, uh, end goal, of course, that there's only a one-world religion, and that can only be when we all unite, we all unite all churches under one roof. And that is the Roman Catholic Church. That's what they are working on. Yeah. Yeah. And the word uh, Catholic today, the word Christian today, in terminology in to the secular world, uh, I'm referring this mainly to the secular world. When you say Christian, they think Catholic because the world considers the Roman Catholic Church Christian. And that is the biggest deception of them all. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Well, uh, uh, anyway, well, we... Can, can, I, can I still read this little article yeah, yes. from the book? Yes, go ahead. Go I, ahead. I really think that would, would be a nice ending and maybe starting uh, anything for the next one. So um, this is from the book Behind the Dictators, Relationship of Nazi Fascism and Roman Catholicism from 1945. Um, and in the foreword, there's a, a thing that I actually like to quote right now. So the quote goes, 
The 19th century left us deplorably weak in true knowledge of history of, uh, in, uh, of the history of state church conflicts. The facts of human development since the Reformation have become so inextricably, inextricably tangled that we have ceased to try to unravel them. We content ourselves in America with the mere superficial knowledge of events, and the conclusions arrived at far from helping us <clears throat> to get at the real truth, only drive us farther away from an understanding of the real meaning of these events. Too much emphasis has been placed upon the mere economic aspect of the world situation. The ideological and theoretical origins of Nazi fascism, as a consequence, have been almost entirely overlooked. Research is necessary to show where social, political, and religious conflicts cross one another. There is abundance of incontestable proof that the forces of religion, as represented by the Catholic Church, have succeeded in, dominate, in dominating the political and social field, and that there exists a close bond between them and the origins, <clears throat> methods, and objectives of the whole Nazi fascist uh, movement in Europe. Furthermore, this domination has already spread to America. History proves that at every attempt made during the past half century against the liberal pro progress of mankind, the Jesuit order, as the leader of the Catholic action, has played a decisive role. We can go even so far as to state that Nazi fascism had its origin in the society of Jesus, and that, like other movements in the past analogous to fascism today, it was planned to serve the traditional aims of the disciples of the disciples of Ignatius of Loyola. End quote. This book is from 1945, so that puts it a little bit into perspective about the 19th century, where America has gone to. Well, we're uh, we're go we're going to broadcast here for another three minutes, and so some of the what he what Yurt um, brought up, we're going to get into uh, more a little bit more on World War One and what happened in Germany. Uh, in uh, World War II. And when we recap it, you'll see that some people say, and I agree, that uh, World War I and World War II were the second 30-year war. And we're going to see the inf influence of, uh, in, in our next broadcast, as we, as we get into World War II, we're going to see the influence of the Jesuits in in and derooting, derooting the Reformation, because the historical events that we've seen since since the Protestant Reformation, the last 500 years, at all all these wars, all the wars we've seen, they changed the name to Inquisition, and they call it now they call it wars. You know, like World War II. I mean, I've I've heard figures: 55 million, 60 million people. They're all crusades. And, and they're all crusades. They're crusades. In, in other words, wh and when Rome has got Protestants killing Protestants, it's my father uh, uh, was in the United States Army and went to Germany. I had a friend ask me this years ago. I think this is kind of fitting in closing. I was out building bee equipment in my garage. And he knew a little bit about me, and he said, and he knew that I, you know, I, I was, I've never been an atheist. I mean, I was listening to some religious tapes I had in my, on my bench. He said, tell me, tell me, Walt, why, why, your dad is a, a German, right? He said, I said, yeah. I said, well, why did he go over to Germany and, and, and shoot at German Lutherans? Interesting. And, you know, at the time, I did not have the answer to that question. But in the, in the future broadcast, we're, we're going to go into that in depth. Why were there American Catholics shooting at German Catholics? This has to be looked at and see. We're not talking, we're not shooting from our hips. I mean, what, what is happening here? What are the mechanics of this? And it goes back to the Jesuits derooting Protestant. What a better way 
to get rid of Protestants is to have Protestants shooting at Protestants, killing each other. It's, it's you know, in other words, and, and then blame somebody else for it. So that so, the end justifies the means and the Pope in the end will be the gainer. That's, that's absolutely. At, at the end game of these events that have been going on in history, if you ask the question, who benefits from these wars? See, who benefited from 9-11? You just got to ask these questions. And the questions will give you, the, the, you know, who benefited will tell you who's, who's behind all this, all this trouble. So, listen, uh, uh, we're going to sign off now. I, I really want to thank uh, Lori. I want to say uh, one thing. Lori uh, Berkebile's uh, Talk News Radio, I have a button up there. It's uh, easy. To, one of the fastest way I use my own site to listen to her broadcast, but if I want to listen to an archive, all you do is go to granddesignexposed.com and go down to the button, click on Lori's Talk News Radio, and, and it, uh, it plays so easy. If you just click on any of the last five broadcasts, you'll be able to listen to her broadcast. And, uh, and then uh, also I have a link to Avenue of Light up there uh, at a time such as this. There's a lot of information and uh, your, on, we have a site up there that we have a broadcast on Sunday. It's uh, Jesuits in 1776, and you can uh, go to that link. And uh, Yerk's got a, a, a link to his YouTube, and there's a link to Avenue of Light and also to Grand Design Exposed. So I'm going to sign off here, and everybody can stay here. We might be able to visit a little bit, I'm gonna, but I'm going to end the broadcast right now, and I want to thank everybody for uh, participating.